people of the African bush. Hello, boy. And on this very special Father's Day, we're bringing you the next best, best thing to a safari right in the center of Africa. We are coming to you live from Juma, Arethusa, and Cheetah Plains private game reserves in the Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. A famous wildlife area that has the most incredible sightings where the lives of these animals, their tragedies and their miseries and their triumphs and their joys have played out unchanged for centuries. My name is Jamie, the man on the camera is Viam, and this is Safari Live. Ready? Standing by. Five, four, three, two, one. You are live, you are live. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Safari Live Father's Day Special live from the Kruger National Park. Why am I in a tree? Well, I just like being in a tree. My name is James Hendry, David's on camera and we have an incredible show for you today live from the iconic Kruger National Park. We're in the middle of eight and a half million acres of untrammeled wildlife wonderland in the northeastern corner of what is possibly the world's most beautiful country. That is South Africa. It's a joy to have you along with us. Please talk to us over the course of the next two hours. Hashtag Safari Live. You can send us questions or comments, or you can send us shout outs to your fathers, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. Now, out in the bush today, you've already met Jamie and that wonderful leopard Sandile. Brent is scouring the land. He's like a sort of feral giraffe knocking about the place, and the ultimate survivor on foot, Stefan Winterboer. You'll meet them all during the course of the drive. Now, come over here. We've got some special technology here to show you some of the incredible wildlife that we have here. Let's go across to the dam camera now. There, that's the dam camera, everybody, and you can see a number of buffalo. And I'm going to show you something quite astonishing now. Next to the rover, whose name is Ronald, is another buffalo. Let's go to the rover camera now. Look at Ronald. Now, Ro <laughs> there's a buffalo you can see. I don't want to move Ronald. There's a buffalo right on the left hand side of Ronald's picture and if I move him I think the buffalo will either get a fright or stamp on me old pal Ronald and that will be an utter disaster. Behind there you can see another two buffalo, one in the water, one standing behind. This is the Cape Buffalo, a marvelous marvelous animal and it is one of the iconic of course big five animals. It is, I'm going to just try, now you can see the rover there, you can see Ronald in the left hand side of your screen and as that buffalo turns his head I'm just going to turn Ronald a little, whoops, the daisies, sorry about that. Now what we're doing here is some sort of experimentation. What we have is a situation where we're interacting with the animals. Ideally we don't want to be, ideally we want to be observing completely. You've seen that we've had the vehicle and the animals have become completely sort of uh, habituated to the vehicles which means that they just get on with their lives without us worrying about them. The same thing we're going to do with Ronald the Rover over the coming months. This is only his second appearance and it's a joy to have him with us. You are most welcome. It's great to have you with us. Hashtag Safari Live. Send us your questions and comments and shout outs. Let's go to the only father on the team, the magnificent specimen that is Stefan Winterboer. Welcome, a very, very warm welcome to the bushwalk segment of this afternoon's sunset safari here on Father's Day. I just want to say a happy Father's Day to all of you and believe me, we're in for a treat this afternoon. Starting off with this, a tropical tent web spider. One of my favorites, I'm Stefan Winterboer and on camera today is Jean Dre and we love these smaller things. Now we are live, we are coming to you on foot from exactly the same bush that Brent and Jamie are driving around in, only we don't have any cars to protect us as you can see. <laughs> and also nothing from stopping Andre from falling over backwards into the hole he almost dived into. <laughs> All right, now this particular spider, we actually don't see them too often. This is a female spider. She's got her tent web lying horizontally to where we are right now. 
and her speciality is catching grasshoppers. Grasshoppers that fly from the ground into the tree, get caught up in all these entanglement snares that you can see between you and me right now, and then they fall into her web, which is lying horizontal and just above where you see her lying at the moment. She's lying around about there and looks like a little piece of bark to you and me right now. She looks like she's actually got a bit of a fly lunch. And what she'd be doing at the moment, she'd have injected it with her venom. That venom is busy basically turning that fly into a fly milkshake. And then she sips up and sucks out that milkshake, discarding the leftover pieces all over the web here. Isn't that amazing? I said we don't really see these spiders too often. Generally speaking, they get knocked out of their webs quite easily and displaced quite easily. We're so lucky that we get to see her the whole time. All right. And that, tropical tent web spider. And on that note, we're going to send you over to Brent. He's got an update for you. Welcome to Safari Live, my name's Brent, I have Brian and the incredible Thumb on camera today. We've just got a report from our tracking team on this Father's Day spectacular that there's a massive herd of elephants on the southern section of the reserve, so we're speeding along to try and get there. I'm hoping because it's Father's Day we're going to find a massive elephant bull and of course some fathers to be amongst the little guys running around. So really, really great start to the day. Leopard and incredible, incredible how the wilderness just seems to keep giving. And oh, speaking of elephants, that is what you call an elephant roadblock. Now incredibly strong animals, they've pushed down this massive tree across the road and uh, I'm definitely not going to be strong enough to move that so I'm going to have to bundu bash around it. Now of course a huge Father's Day Happy, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out in the world and uh, especially also to my dad who is watching. Normally he doesn't watch. Uh, he's normally on game drive at the same time I am. So happy Father's Day uh, to my dad who I know is watching and hopefully he'll be with those elephants shortly. Now remember, if you want to send a shout out to your dad, if you want uh, to send us a question about what we're seeing on this live African safari, you can do that by using the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. So while we dash through this beautiful African savanna, let's go across to Jamie who's with that young male leopard. Um, we don't need to do any dashing about the savanna. We've got this incredible young male leopard right here in front of us on a live safari. I have to introduce you to this young boy. His name is Sindile and he has a story that is absolutely one of the most incredible that I have ever heard. And a year ago when we knew Sindile, when he was just a cub, he was just under a year old, he was like any other normal young male leopard playful, learning, experimenting and learning to hunt. His mother Shadow was, is a fantastic female leopard, the daughter of the famous Queen of Juma, Karula, a leopard dynasty that has been followed for years across the world. And then Sindile's luck changed completely and everything was totally turned on its head in his life. How oh, he caught and killed a stray dog that had somehow managed to wander from the townships into the game reserve. And it was something that was seen on our live safaris. And very unfortunately, that dog tested positive for rabies. And we were all filled with fear that that might be the end of Sindile's life as a wild leopard. But due to the incredibly committed work of vets and various rehabilitation centers, Sindile was placed into quarantine for about eight months before being released into the wild after a course of vaccinations against rabies. And here he is today, just two and a half months after his release back into the wild. And that is why he wears a collar as he does. It's to help the people in charge of him 
to date on his movements and his health. Now, yesterday, we had the most phenomenal story that played out with Brent, one that had us all sitting on the edge of our seats, filled with terror, and also, in our own way, completely torn between Sindile and his mother. So if you missed our, bless you, <laughs> yeah, boy. If you missed our live safari yesterday, it was the first time that Sindida had been seen back with his mother. And his mother had a, has a brand new three month old cub. And she was calling frantically to try and locate her cub and fighting with Sindile, growling at him, trying to keep her, him away from the cub. We had absolutely no idea how the situation was going to play out. And incredibly, we had to find that the cub was alive and that there was a happy ending to this entire story. It was just absolutely magical and an incredible story. Now, Tom, you were wondering whether or not we would ever interfere with a leopard that was trying to kill a cub. Tom, unfortunately, we absolutely couldn't. We can't. The only time that we will ever interfere is as what happened with Sindile, where the reason that that animal is in the situation that it's in is because of the actions of man themselves. In this case, his exposure to a domestic dog. Our leopards have become famous and much loved across the world. James is in the tent at the moment and he has some of their stories to tell you. Welcome back to my wonderful office here in the midst of, well, the wilderness. It's a joy to be here and it's a joy to be with you. We've got a couple of shout outs come through already. Joe, you want to wish your father Pete a very happy Father's Day. Thank you for that. Uh, Chelsea, all the way from Vermont, wishes to, she's uh, obviously right here in the Sabi Sands, wants to, wants to send a shout out to her father Ted Green in Vermont as well. We'll get through a couple more as we go through the rest of the afternoon. Now, I've got something quite special to show you, but I'm not going to let David show you what it is. It's under the microscope. Have a look at this. Now what I want you to do everybody is tell me what you think that is. It is a male. It was probably a very good, well it was probably a father, not the most attentive fathers in the world, but see if you can get from what's in the microscope there what that animal is. Send your answers through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Alternatively, well that's the only way you can do it really, uh, and certainly send us your shout outs for your fathers. We still want to hear from you all the time. Now, the leopards of this area, of Juma specifically, we have a relationship with and we've had some incredible interactions with them. Have a look quickly at these sort of highlights of our relationship with the leopards of Juma. The leopard is the ultimate combination of feline beauty, power and strength. This is the complete ambush predator solitary, elusive and stealthy. The leopard either grabs its prey in a lethal throat hold that silences and suffocates or it severs the spine with one bite. Leopards will eat anything from termites all the way to giraffe. They also prey on other predators. But protection and mentorship of young leopards falls to their mother and none is more famous at Juma than Karula. This extraordinary leopardess has raised eight cubs, a testimony to both her skill and her luck. In February this year, Karula gave birth to two perfect little cubs, a playful male and a more reserved female. With the proper learning and luck, these leopards will stalk Juma for years to come. leopard. There's a quick look at some of the prints of cats. I think my most favorite cat out here and what a joy it is to be spending the amount of time that we do with them. This is a male leopard skull and I'm just going to put it next to my own so you can see a general size. Sindile, who you're about to go and see again, is, well, he's a bit smaller than this. He's probably about 70% the size of this one. So he's got a bit of growing to do. He'll soon get some fairly... Uh, well, he's already got very large teeth, but they'll get even larger, believe it or not. Let's go back to him and find out what he's doing. On this very special Father's Day, we bring you the magic of a live safari. 
Now, my name is Jamie, and this is Sindile, and this is the most phenomenal way to start off an afternoon game drive. Now, Sindile has moved from where he was yesterday on Arethusa right into the heart of Juma Private Game Reserve, and we're actually sitting not more than 500 yards away from where James is at the tent. And looking at Sindile now, this is the first time I have seen him in close to a year since he was taken into quarantine. And to see him now looking so good, so well fed, he looks like he's got not a full, full belly, but he's looking healthy and he is just looking extraordinary. I'm so happy to see a leopard that had wormed his way into my heart, but is now even more so due to the odds that he's had to face and what he has overcome in order to be where he is today. And we have a lot of people to thank for that. <laughs> the flies are driving him absolutely insane. It really is the most incredible sight to see. And that collar serves a hugely important function in monitoring his movements and making sure that he is still healthy and okay. And don't you find it absolutely amazing that a leopard could be in quarantine for as long as Sindile was and still be released straight back into the wild, hunt for himself, look after himself. I mean, when he was taken into quarantine, he was just a tiny cub. Well, not a tiny cub, but he was still at least a year from independence from his mother. And yet here he sits, a male leopard, not quite in his prime, but with every hope of reaching it. And if Sindile does go on to become a father, he's got a long way to go yet. A good couple of years before he's big enough and strong enough to compete for his own territory. But I think that if his personality is anything to go by, if the way that he's survived the odds so far tells us anything, it's that our Sindile is going to be a force to be reckoned with when he is older. Now he's resting up in the shade because it's an absolutely extraordinarily warm day here in the African bush despite the fact that we are in totally the middle of our winter. But he's found himself the perfect shady spot, very comfortable with his head framed by thorns. Our little survivor is still going strong. And speaking of survival and survival skills, Steph would like to show you a few tricks and trades of the African bush. Welcome back to the bushwalk everybody and for those of you who have just joined us, my name is Steph Vintibur and you are on foot in the middle of Juma Private Game Reserve all the way from South Africa's Kruger National Park. And what we've got here is a massive pile of elephant dung and what elephant dung is good for is a variety of things but on this a very, very special Father's Day. I'm going to show you how we transport fire using elephant dung. And the reason I'm doing this is because I love making fire with my little boy. And I tell you, there's nothing better than sitting down, preparing the sticks, getting it all good. I love it more than anything. So let's, here it goes. I'm not very good at doing this. I must be honest with you. Sometimes it doesn't really work that well, but I'm going to give it a bash. So what do we use? Is a piece of dried elephant dung and then I use a magnesium stick. We send some sparks into the elephant dung. As you can see, it starts to smolder quite readily. And then you just coax a flame out of it by blowing. And not only is this a good way of transporting fire, as you can see, it smolders. You can keep it, you can keep fire going like this for an age. Not only is it a good way of, of, uh, of transporting fire, but the smoke that comes off of this elephant dung is actually used traditionally for a headache cure. So you blow on it, and the smoke, you waft over, over your face, breathing it in lightly, and apart from the slight bit of euphoria that it gives you, a little lightheadedness, all right, we're going to be going into an ad break soon. You have to stay and watch. We've got something really, really surprising coming up straight after that. All righty. 
But now, for the rest of you who are left with us, I'm going to have to put this out. So, oh, <laughs> not only does it help you with a headache, but it, as you can see, it smolders readily. This will take about 30 minutes to burn through completely. And then all you do is you light another one from exactly the same one. You carry on transporting it wherever you need to. Awesome, hey? Now let's put it out. Alrighty, now from lit elephant dung to the things that make the elephant dung. Hopefully you can... We are completely surrounded by a massive herd of elephants. Look at this, there's a tiny little one here. There's a female who's got a very interesting recurved tusk. We are on a live African safari. It is Father's Day and uh, we've found some father's creations with this big herd. Some tiny little ones. It's probably about 30 or 40 elephants around us at the moment. Both sides of us. Look at that. Tiny! Now we're just going to move so we can get into a good spot to see them. Oh, it's you too. Yeah, I'm just trying to position so we can get those Ellie's walking up to us again. We go. Hello everybody, back again, I'm echoing. That's because the sound was on and you've had to come back to us. You do know, of course, that we're live from the African bush and of course that brings with it certain technological difficulties. But anyway, here we are. What we're going to try and do now, I think, is probably head across to the rover cam. Check out this buffalo. Now, he's a little suspicious and they say that buffalo look at you as though you owe them money. Well, I think this buffalo certainly looks like that. Uh, he's deeply, deeply confused. Now, we're going to hope desperately that he stays precisely where he is until the TV comes back. We've got two minutes left. I must apologize for Ronald's slightly squonk picture, but that's just the way Ronald is, you know. He's not very, uh, he's not very level-headed fellow. Anyway, like I said yesterday, having all of you along with us, our regular viewers and perhaps some new ones as a result of yesterday, uh, it feels like a, a team of people joyfully watching us and I thank you very much for your support and the rest of the team does too. I can't believe we've got Sundile here. I think it's the most spectacular thing in the world. Um, I know I've often said that Mvula, our 13-year-old male leopard friend, was my favourite but it's a tough close call between him and Sindile. Sindile, well, he's almost two years old. He's had a very challenging life. And that's the reason, you know, I used to like Mbula so much is because he's not the biggest leopard in the world. And I'm, well, I'm not the biggest man in the world. And so finding a small fellow like that out here that has made such a success of himself, I think is just so very special. Right, here we're going back to the rover, everybody. We're going to come out of the internet onto TV with the rover but not out of the internet, that's a terrible way of putting it. Uh, everything will remain completely the same for you. All right, here we go. Here we go. Oh, there's still 30 seconds, 30 to go. Oh. Twenty seconds, twenty. Everybody, please excuse my silence. I'm just uh, sort of stealing myself. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody, to this Father's Day spectacular. In the middle of your screen, a buffalo lying down. Ronald is filming him. That's Ronald the Rover. You are live from the iconic Kruger National Park. It's a joy to have you with us. It's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Send us your shout outs for your fathers. Send us your questions to hashtag Safari Live and we'll answer all of those that we can and we'll send as many shout outs as we possibly can. One of the most <laughs> marvellous things about this, of course, is that we have so many different feeds. Let's just have one more quick look at Ronald the Rover. 
and he is now, I just want to tell you a little bit more about him. He's, this is his second TV special, of course, and he is, I know, uh, at a little bit of an angle. Uh, he's not a level-headed fellow, is our Ronald, but that buffalo was looking at him deeply suspiciously, and so Ronald didn't want to move at all and uh, make it a little bit scared. Let's head across to the ultimate survivor. He has found a reptilian friend. Welcome back to the bushwalk and we've got a little surprise here for you. Right here at the end of my finger is a girdled lizard living in this burnt out stump. Now what makes girdled lizards so fantastic for me is that they only live on one stump for almost their entire lives. And they're really really pretty little lizards. They have scales that have got these big ridges on them. And you might be able to see some just behind his head. It's almost a spiny lizard. It has so many ridges on him. Now, unfortunately, the pet trade all over the world trades in these little guys because they're easy to find. They're easy to find in these stumps. They don't go anywhere and they're really, really pretty. And so it's quite rare to find one of these girdled lizards outside of a national park like we're in at the moment. We find quite a few of them, but I must be honest with you, Outside of the reserves, we don't see many of these at all. Now what he's hoping to catch is a bunch of, they call it invertebrates. All right, he is now just looking at me. He knows that I'm here. I know that he's there. Doesn't have a tongue like a traditional lizard would that flicks out taste the air and flick in. They've got quite a thick tongue. It's quite purplish. Can you believe it? They'll come out during the day, bask on this log at the top. They get all their energy from the sun. They are cold-blooded, which means that all the metabolic energy that they need to process their food is harvested from the sun and from the environment around them. And from there, he will move between the shade and his sunspots only when it's hot and hunt for the rest of this log for all these beetles. Uh, he's disappeared a little bit deeper into the, into the stump. Alrighty. Still in there. <laughs> While we get up and carry on finding you some more interesting things to look at, Brent's back with those elephants. We've caught up with this massive herd of elephants and we've just parked ahead of them and I'm hoping they're going to walk right next to the vehicle. Remember this is live, it's Father's Day. If you want to know about elephants or send your dad a shout out, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now these are incredible animals. A big, big male can weigh up to 14,000 pounds. The adult females that are around us probably weigh around 9, 10,000 pounds and incapable of consuming a massive amount of veg vegetation in a day. Oh, there comes a mom and a little one walking at the back. That little baby is probably a year and a half, two years old. There we go. Now the rest of the herd is just up here and we're not gonna make ourselves or push ourselves into their space. We're going to wait here and let them come to us rather. Uh, hi, Alan. Big welcome on the back of the game drive vehicle. Alan says, well, I know you guys don't try to uh, push the animals too far or keep your, your distance, but has there ever been a time when they've come after me? Uh, not really. There has been a few close moments with, with elephants, but not here uh, in the Central African rainforest and in Botswana. But fortunately, nothing since I've been here. And also, the elephant gives you warning signs that they're unhappy and gives you a chance to get out of that area before it becomes too risky. So here they come. Oh. Big, big herd coming. If you have a look just behind here, you can see the dust created from their feet. So you can see quite windy today. And we are in a drought. That's where all that dust is coming from. Isn't that absolutely spectacular? 
Now these elephants are free to roam in a massive eight and a half million acre unfenced wilderness area called the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. And oh, coming right up to us behind these ones. Look at that. These guys are going to come a bit closer than those. Now I'm sitting on Juma Private Game Reserve at the moment, enjoying the spectacular elephant sighting. Now elephants can be a bit nervous in the wind. They're not showing any of those signs at the moment, but we're not going to chase them around too much. I'm going to let them just disappear. Oh, there we go, a little snort. And look at that trunk. Over a hundred thousand muscles in there. Hi Debbie in Vancouver, welcome to this live African safari and on this Father's Day weekend and speaking of fathers, Debbie would like to know do adult elephant bulls play any part in the rearing of the young? They play very very little part Debbie, they're, they're generally only found with the breeding herds and that's what we call a group of females and youngsters. When there's a female in heat and they are going to mate, normally they try spend their time away from the the breeding herds and only coming into contact with them when it's time for mating they don't have a set mating season as such but elephants very interestingly can will only mate when the females in estrus or heat and the males in a heightened hormonal uh, state called must and uh, then those elephant bulls can be a little bit more unpredictable then I am hoping we are going to find a massive eddy bull before the end of this live African safari. As I said, in the strong wind, I'm not going to put any pressure. I'm going to let those elephants meander off into the distance. And I think we're going to go see what else we can find in this absolutely incredible African wonderland that we are privileged enough to call home. So while we do that, you know, I was talking about numbers and places. James is going to explain a little bit more in detail about exactly where we are. So this is a sort of zoomed in map of Juma Private Game Reserve. It's 3,000 acres of wonderful wildlife land. Now none of the lines that you can see on this map are lines that the animals have to pay attention to. Like I said at the beginning, we're in the middle of eight and a half million acres of landscape that the animals are free to come and go across as they please. These are just human boundaries that we're not allowed to cross. Now I'm going to show you where everyone is. Brent is around this water hole here and those elephants with any luck will go down and have a drink. There's an elephant. That's a very beautiful elephant, isn't it, David? Lovely. Jim. Lovely elephant. Thank you very much. And then Steph is somewhere around here, west of what we call Treehouse Dam, which is down there. There it is there. We'll draw Steph. Steph doesn't have much hair, nor do I, so we'll just give him side hair and a stick, of course. And then, of course, we have Jamie, and Jamie is with that magnificent male leopard over here, actually not far from where we are. There we are. There's Jamie, beautiful Jamie, like an elegant antelope, of course. And of course, she's with Sindila, who is a cat. Wonderful. Now, we are actually just over here, not far at all. In fact, that's exactly where we are. We are not far from where you are. Ronald the rover is sitting over there. And that's basically the lay of the land at the moment. Now, what we're going to do, you've seen those incredible elephants with Brent. We've spent about 30 years, well not me personally of course, I'm much too young for that. But we've spent 30 years in the Sabi Sands here with game drive vehicles. And the elephants have developed a relationship with us, as have the leopards. Take a look at this. Elephants are an iconic keystone species of the wilderness and they have captured our hearts and minds like no other. The herds are fascinating to observe and extremely important to the health of African ecosystems. Elephants live in complex matriarchal societies. Calves are raised and mentored by caring relatives and friends and their playfulness and intelligence in so many ways mimics our own. He is very, very close. He's pushing his trunk against the car. You can feel the car moving. 
More than 30 years of human activity has made the elephants of the Sabi sand relatively comfortable around our vehicles. Sometimes, however, their trusting nature turns to curiosity. Normally, elephants will give a warning if they are uncomfortable with our presence. But six tons of curious elephant can be intimidating, and this huge bull crossed the line between curiosity and comfort. While no animal is inherently aggressive, an enormous animal like this bull is potentially very dangerous. Just a glance from these giants is enough to command our respect in the Sabi Sand. Well, this, everybody, was the answer to the quiz. And Lucy Spaulding, you said it was a lion's tooth. Uh, Lucy, not quite a tooth, more a thumbnail. This is the dew claw of a big male lion who I'm sure was a father. Now, Ellen, I don't think your father is a lion, but he is in Afghanistan. And you don't know if he's able to watch or not, but we'll just send a special Safari Live Father's Day shout out to him all the way in Afghan. And I hope you're not missing him too much on this very special day. Right, I think we're moving across now back to our hopefully father-to-be one day, Sandile the Leopard. Welcome back onto the back of your live safari vehicle experience where we are still with our extraordinary young male leopard. He's just given us a few yawns just before you came across to us and he's showing some signs of restlessness although I think that most of those are due to the flies fluttering about his ears and causing that constant twitching. Now as the shadows start to lengthen and the temperature drops the wind is blowing out here in the middle of Juma Private Game Reserve. Our lion may be the master of the night, but a leopard, a leopard is a jack of all trades. Definitely by far the most adaptable of the creatures. Their camouflage gives them the most incredible advantage when it comes to just sheer stealth. They are built for strength and for secrecy and subtlety. Now, as the wind starts to blow, we've got the perfect hunting conditions. Now, you've seen how thick this vegetation is around us. It's the perfect spot for a leopard to hide out. And given their opportunistic nature and the fact that he is totally hidden and that the wind is howling and pushing his smell away from us, there's always a chance that an unsuspecting antelope might come through. But for now, he's doing what cats do and cats do best. <laughs> which is being perfectly relaxed. Now, Kathy, on our special Father's Day, you wanted to know if Sindile's father will recognize and accept him. Oh, there's a thorn there, boy. That doesn't look very comfortable at all. Definitely not the best spot to roll over. Well, Kathy, a warm welcome onto the back of our live safari. The answer is, we don't really know. Sindile is at that crucial cusp of adulthood where he would be becoming independent and disperse away from his mother. First of all, we don't know who Sindile's father is. We've got a couple of candidates. They could be Tingana the male leopard, the Anderson male leopard, or Mvula the male leopard that sprang into action yesterday completely unexpectedly and completely taking us by surprise. This is an unprecedented situation, Kathy. We have no idea how things are going to play out. In a normal leopard's life, if Sindile's father was around and he'd been with his mother the whole time, he would have been absolutely fine. But the truth is, these are wild animals playing out a scenario that is, as I said, without precedent and completely confusing. And the animals do not read the textbooks, which means that for our live safari, the rawest and truest way of watching wildlife in Africa, you never know what to expect. You'll have to stay tuned after the break to find out what happens. For those of you who are watching on the internet, you don't have to worry about missing out on one single moment of the potential action. I spoke before about how incredible it is to see Sindile, and it really truly is. Those of you who've been our regular viewers, and I know most of our long-term viewers, most of you watch on the internet. So you'll be familiar with just how special this leopard truly is to us. 
So to be reunited with him, I mean, I don't think that, to be honest, I don't think that he cares either way who's watching him. He's, we're so naturally a part of his life. But to be reunited with him and to see him once again is a very uplifting experience. It's just such a special story and a story that through every step, I always felt was never going to have a happy ending. Well, at least I hope for a happy ending, but the the part of me that was trying to be the most rational and to prepare myself for the worst was prepared to accept that we may never have seen Sindelia again. And to see him back here is incredible. To watch how the situation plays out is absolutely fascinating. And to wonder what on earth is going through this little leopard's head, or oh, not so little anymore, big leopard's head, because he certainly has grown. What must he have thought yesterday with his mother? Oh, oh, foot, foot on thorn. It's also incredible to see how much he's grown, how his face has stretched out. He's got that adult male leopard face, but still young male. And I'm pretty sure that of all of the leopards, a young male leopard is one of the most attractive to look at. They're just so incredibly perfect looking. And there you go for a quick update for those of you who are concerned about the collar and the way in which it is, where it is situated and how it might affect him, that collar does drop off eventually. So he will be, I think he may be fitted at some point with another collar, We're not, I'm not entirely sure. There's a good chance he may be fitted with another collar, but obviously as a young leopard, he is a growing boy and he will need space to fill out. Fortunately for us, the people that are in charge of monitoring Sindile and have been responsible for releasing him or rescuing him and then releasing him know exactly what they're doing and how to handle this situation. It is the most extraordinary story and I think Sindile might be on his way to becoming one of the most famous leopards in the world. Because and we've been fortunate enough to watch it pretty much from start until now. Who knows where the end of the story lies? There's a chance, there's a very good chance, that we may, once Sindile does disperse, that we may not see him again. When he's old enough to establish his territory, he might move away completely in the same way that Mishu and Induna, Karula's older cubs, moved towards the Kruger and towards Manuleti. We'll just have to rely on the updates from the other guides in this area to keep us informed. Then, of course, there's the fact that in some of the long, largest dispersals recorded, male leopards can go up to a good 300, even f maybe even 400 miles from their original place of birth before they establish themselves a territory. They just keep moving until they find that basically that vacuum of male leopards or until they find an old male leopard that they're young enough and strong enough to push out and push away from their territory. We'll just have to wait and see what happens with Sindide. With his ears twitching away. I wonder what Sindile might be dreaming about. I always think that when I sit with sleeping big cats. They look so peaceful and content and so terribly comfortable, no matter how uncomfortable the position is that they've managed to find themselves in. They, I imagine chasing things falls pretty high up on that list. I wonder what made Sindile decide to come in this direction. This is a little bit far out of what he wouldn't have known as his natal range. But he's been all over the show since he was first released. Right around through Kruger, right down south towards Mala Mala, and then back up north. He just kept bouncing about, and now we have him back with us. TV is about to return to us. We shall prepare for their imminent arrival. We'll wait and see what Sindile decides to do. For a moment, let's just enjoy the sighting of this glorious leopard.
and a very warm welcome back and welcome to those of you who may in fact just have jumped on board this incredible wildlife experience on our very special Father's Day we bring you the best and most fantastic way of viewing African wildlife short of being here a live safari from the center of the African bush gives you the truest reflection of the way in which we get to experience these animals. They write the stories for us, we just have to follow on and bring you what they're telling us. My name is Jamie and we are coming to you live from the middle of Juma private game reserves in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Now don't forget on this Father's Day you may not have been able to take your dad out to the African bush for the weekend, but you can send through your shout outs wherever you may be, and we will pass them on to your fathers wherever they may be. So while our leopard snoozes away and does what leopards often do best, let's head across to Brent because he has something very large and something very grey. We've just found a massive elephant bull, but it sounds like there's a whole herd of elephants around here. He's almost an adult, but he's still incredibly tall. He's probably around 14 foot at the shoulder. We can see him just through there. And there he is. And there's a little female in front. And now he's not any, even fully grown and we're going to be able to see the size difference between an elephant bull and an elephant cow. Remember, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And remember, we're on a live African safari with the biggest land mammal in the world, the African elephant. And at the moment, we're just joining the herd, following them as they go. Well, and uh, since it's Father's Day, my dad just tweeted. I, I said Happy Father's Day to him a bit earlier, but he's just letting everyone know on Twitter that we've grown up on a game reserve. So, yes, we've been very lucky uh, in my growing up, and I've been very fortunate. That most of the firsts in the bush I've ever had have been with my dad. First time elephant on foot, first time lion on foot, uh, first time charged by an elephant. Everything was with my dad. Okay, now let's get back to the elephant. Who's... Probably not a dad just yet. I guess he's mid twenties. There he goes. And he's on a mission. He's following the breeding herd. Now it's not uncommon to find these younger bulls on the peripheries of the herds. So you might see, I might drive over a little bush or whatnot, but we straddle them which means they pop up straight away once we go over them. And I'm hoping this big Ellie bull is going to lead us to another herd of elephants. Are we going to, isn't this incredible? We're following an elephant path that is being used by an elephant on a live African safari. And you can see he's completely relaxed with his wagging tail and he is going to go into some thick bush so we're going to let him wander off we're going to see what other fabulous creatures are out and about while we do that james has got a reptile in a jar that was a fly everyone and this is a bibron's thick-toed gecko now if you are feeling uh, a uh, little less than cheerful, say Bibron's thick-toed gecko a few times and roll your R's and you shall feel better immediately. Um, a very nice shout out to Daniel Kirby Wilcox II from his various offspring. I hope you're having a wonderful Father's Day. Now, this Bibron's thick-toed gecko is now, well, it's dead. You can see his name's Gregory the Gecko and he has long since deceased. But we can get a wonderful picture with this microscope of his feet. Now you've all seen geckos in your homes and you've wondered how on earth it is that they manage to stick to the surfaces that they do. Well that's how. 
Look at those pads on the bottom of the gecko's feet. I think that's incredible. Now, on each of those pads is a hair, and the hairs are no more than five microns across. That is five thousandths of a millimeter. Now, I don't know what that is in the imperial system because inches, I don't think, go down to as small as five millionths of a meter. So that's how a gecko manages to stick onto the wall of your house. I think they're wonderful creatures because they like to, uh, well, they like to eat all the flies and the mosquitoes that knock about the place, and I think that's a great thing. Now, we can go back across to the rover. Let's have a look here. And <laughs> I moved Ronald, and you can see there that that buffalo, which was looking at him very suspiciously indeed, is now chewing its cud. You can see just below Ronald's eye level there, you can see chewing away thoughtfully. There is the damn camera. You can see there that Ronald is now about, just to give you some perspective, he's probably about, I don't know, 40 feet or so from that buffalo. A deeply aged old buffalo bull, probably won't be a father again, probably is a father though. And all over him, you would have seen those amazing birds. Those are called oxpeckers, and they like to eat the ticks and other ectoparasites of a beautiful animal like that old grizzly buffalo bull. Let's go back to our friend, the feral giraffe, Mr. Brent Leo Smith. He's got more elephants. Look at that, isn't just the cutest thing. We didn't have to meander far before we stumbled on another herd of elephants. And this baby is a matter of months old. It is tiny. Hello, Mom. Here we go. Mom's got some a snack to take with on her way through. But we're going to stick with this elephant herd. There's probably about 60 of them all around us at the moment. Now, she's a really nice big female. She's also tuskless, which is quite unusual. And you do find tuskless cows from time to time. Remember, we are being surrounded by elephants on a live African safari in the middle of the African bush. I'm on Juma... Uh, sorry, no, I've jumped across to Arethusa private game reserve at the moment. And if you want to send your dad a shout out or you want to ask a, a question about these incredible animals, you can do that using the hashtag Safari Live. But behind us is the only daddy I've seen in this herd. He's a big bull. He's definitely sired a baby or two. Who knows, maybe even that little baby we just saw. So sometimes they do join the herds and he's got a beautiful set of tusks on him as well. Hello, mister. Big Safari Live welcome to Denise and her son who is four years old and joining us on this live safari. Great to have you on board. She'd like to know how tall that little elephant who just went past us was. About, I would guess, about 40 inches at the shoulder. Oh, look, this is a, a big adult bull. He's over 30 years old. So even though elephants reach their sexual maturity in their mid-teens. The bulls are unable to mate until they get to about 30 due to the competition from the other big bulls. So it's a tough time being a male elephant till you get <laughs> to 30 years old. And they're incredibly long-lived and have about, lived to about 65. And I'm guessing this guy in front of us is maybe around 40. This massive herd is moving through the bush. I'm really hoping this big boy decides to stop snacking and come walk right next to us. Uh, when you're in these situations surrounded by elephant herds, it's very important to watch their body language. And even, oh, here he comes. Here he comes. Hello, big boy. Now, if you look carefully on his tusk, there's a very interesting little mark there and it almost looks like someone's carved a little hole in the tusk it's what you call a grass notch so he gets that from where he brings grass through uh, using his trunk and his tusk to pick grass and he uses that right tusk more than the left tusk so he's right tusked elephant 
and you get left tusked elephants as well and every now and then you get an ambidextrous elephant and while we were watching him the original elephant bull we first spotted has decided to sneak up behind us Tasha, hi, welcome on the live safari. Hello, boy, you're coming to say hello. Tasha, I'll get to you in a second. I just wanted to see if this Ellie was going to come right up to us. You can actually see our shadow right there. That's how close he is to us. You know, Brian's thumbs up there. Uh, Tasha's wondering, how do I tell how old they are? Tasha, it is a bit of guesswork. I, I, I'm not going to lie. It's easier with the juveniles and uh, the, the young ones. And based on their size, you can normally tell how old they are. Uh, with these guys, if I look at the indentations on the head there, you can see um, he doesn't have deep indentations. But he's quite young. He's in very good condition. And if I have a look at the older bull, I'm just going to get you into a spot where you can see his head. You actually see how those indentations have started sinking on his skull. So that's what leads me to believe, and I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure about this that that bull's a little bit older or quite a bit older maybe 10 or 15 years older and we are on Arethusa private game reserve at the moment in the Sabi Sand South Africa part of the greater Kruger National Park and we are in the middle of a herd of about 60 elephants isn't this absolutely amazing a live African safari if you had told me a couple of years ago that I would be taking a live game drive in the middle of the African bush, I would have uh, probably not believed you. So there we go, he's going to pop out there. Now if we look on his temple, you can see there's indentations there, and that's a little bit older. And there we go, if we come out a bit please Brian, see the size difference between a female and a male. That is a particularly small female though. <laughs> Now, you might notice as we drive around and move through, there's lots of big piles of orange stuff on the road. Now, those are the leavings of an elephant, and Steph's got some to show you. Well, thank you, James, and welcome back to the Bushwalk. For those of you who have just joined the Bushwalk, my name's Steph Winterboot, and we're right in the middle of the same area that you've been driving around in. Wasn't that big elephant bull that you saw earlier fantastic? Now, what I quite like doing is sharing my survival knowledge with you, especially all you dads out there on Father's Day. You've got something that I'm going to show you right now that will surprise your children. They'll be talking about it at school for the rest of their lives. This is a very, very big, fresh pile of elephant dung. You can see how big it is. There's my two fists. Massive. Now, water is very, very crucial out here in, in Africa. It's also very crucial to survival. You can't go more than three days without water here in, in the bush. You do more than three weeks without food, but you can't do more than three days without water. And so finding water is a treasure and one that you absolutely have to make every opportunity of getting as much as you can when it's there. Now as you can see, this sand right here has no water in it. It's as dry as a bone. We're in the midst of one of the biggest droughts that we've got here in the country, in South Africa, in living memory. But this elephant hasn't battled to find water. Ellie's drink probably about, I don't know, anywhere up to about 50 gallons or so of water in a day. And that mostly comes out in their dung. But what you can do, oh by the way, this is a snail shell that I found nearby. These snails die in the drought. It's the biggest giant land snail that we get, probably one of the biggest mollusks on the earth. Land based ones anyway. They make very handy cups. What you do is you take the elephant dung, as you can see, fresh green vegetable juice. All you health conscious out there are messing. That is a no-no out here. Once you've got enough, as you can see, this was actually just one piece of dung. You take it, lift it up to your mouth and say bon appetit. Ah, doesn't taste too bad, a little bit salty, but a little bit 
like vegetable juice for lack of a better word. Not as many carrots as I expected, but then hey, it is elephant dung. And that's how you get wart out here in the African bush. Awesome. All right, and from that, we're going to send you over to Jamie, who's got some leopard for you. <laughs> While Steph is so full of survival tips, perhaps he could have given some delay some lessons before he was released back into the wild. Isn't this incredible though? We are just 18 feet from a leopard on live television. A live safari with a leopard close enough for us to examine the strands of his fur is one of the most incredible things and I do hope that it provides a special little treat for all of you fathers out there. And happy Father's Day to Steph who is a father himself and will hopefully be teaching his son those lessons at some point in the future. But back to our incredible young male leopard. There is something in my experience in all my years of guiding that draws human beings to leopards. Not, I mean, to be up close and personal with them, but there is just something about their majesty and their grace and their sheer beauty that people find irresistible. And almost inevitably you find when you have guests that have come to stay at a safari lodge, they're desperate to see the leopard, the most elusive of Africa's big cats. Uh, the females are graceful and awe-inspiring. The males are just incredible with their large thick necks and the young males are the absolute characters of the bush. Young males of Sindile's age are just so incredibly intelligent. Let's just have a close, oh he's giving us a nice, have a nice look at the side of his mouth and the side of his spots because it gives us a chance to answer Jan's question who is watching. Happy Father's Day Jan. You want to know what do you call the unique markings on a leopard's face? There it's spot patterns, Jan. That's all that it is. Oh, he's giving us hello boy. An incredible view of his intact pearly whites, those long, sharp canines. Well, Jan, it's fantastic to have you on this safari. They are the spot patterns, and each and every leopard is completely unique. Isn't that incredible to think there, is no, there are no two leopards in the world that look exactly the same? The individual leopard is the top spot pattern, the top row of spots that runs along their whisker line. So from what I've been able to see of Sindile, he is what we would call a 3-3 three, three leopard. So he's got three spots on the left and three spots on the right. But that combination in all of the leopards can be something like a 4-3 or a 3-3 three, three, or a 2-1 anything like that. So while our leopard sleeps and we wait for the shadows to creep further up and for Sindile to get up, let's go back over to Brent whose elephants are providing him with endless entertainment. Those trunks, even an elephant of that size will be incredibly, incredibly strong. And now there's just the big bull still on his way. I'm trying to see, we're in quite a thick area here. There he is. Now he's just keeping on the peripheries of the herd, following them. They are going into some very, very, very thick bush. So I'm going to let them be. They've given us such an amazing time. And while we try to find our way out of the middle of this bush where there's not a road in sight, right, let's go to James who's got a retired creature. Well everybody, I have my old friend here, George the Giraffe, and I imagine that Brent Leo Smith's skull looks something like this if you were to get under all of that impressive locks of hair. Uh, he is about as tall as George once was. George, of course, is now very short, owing to the fact that he no longer has a spinal column or indeed the rest of his body. This is just his head. But George is still making a valuable contribution to the ecology of this area. Look in the back there and you can see what looks like a little waxy pimple. Can you see that? Now, I'm going to show you, look at that, there's a stingless bee coming out of the waxy little pimple there, and that's because inside George's not insubstantial cranium, Brent has a bigger brain than this giraffe did, and 
not in, inside it lives some stingless bees. Now let me just get some focus on them with this microscope and maybe we'll have, be able to see them in glorious high definition. There we are. Let's see. Now, what we want is one of those bees to come out, of course. They've been very, very confiding for the last little while. What I'm going to do is just, there he comes. There comes a bee. Come on, fella. Don't be afraid. It's Father's Day. And I know that you are not a father and you will never be because you are a sterile female. But that's okay. You're still welcome to Father's Day. While we wait for this bee, a lovely shout out from Christy. There he comes. Christy, you wanted to wish your father a very happy Father's Day. He's no longer with you, and I'm sorry about that. But I'm sure wherever he is, on whatever shore he is living, in a far greater light than we are living here, I'm sure he appreciates your shout out to him. So thank you, Christy. Look at this amazing bee. Isn't that incredible? Look at his mouth parts. Beautiful. Oh, another one. Just deposited a bit of wax there. Incredible, incredible stuff. The two feelers, the mouth parts, these are all females, like I say. And of course, this a matriarchal society run by a queen. And that's why they're not fighting with each other, of course. I think that is just one of the most spectacular pictures I have ever seen. Isn't that unbelievable? They do make honey inside the cranium. Apparently, I've never eaten it, but it's a rare delicacy out here that people like to eat. And it's quite, um, it's sourish honey. It's sort of sweet and sour honey, not like the honey bees make. Let's go back to the ultimate ultimate survival man who is now uh, not drinking elephant dung, but seemingly lying inside it. <laughs> almost lying inside it, James, almost lying inside it. Welcome back to the bushwalk, everybody. And you know what? We've got one of my favorite, favorite insects right in front of us, right here. This is a grass-like mantis. Just have a look at that. How camouflaged is he? I want to pick some grass over here and bring it next to him to show you how much like grass he looks. And that's obviously where he hunts. He hunts on grass piles and on piles of elephant dung like this, catching whatever he can. Flies, grasshoppers, crickets, bees and wasps. Can you believe it? These arms extend almost double. That there extends double. Is, has these... <laughs> <laughs> what he did there was he attacked his reflection in the lens. Look at those wicked spikes that he has on his catching forelimbs. Have a look at that. Can you imagine if these guys were as big as giraffes? What's fascinating for me is even his eyes are camouflaged. Let's see. Even his eyes are camouflaged. Looking like grass seeds. Just one of the most impressive hunters I can ever think of. Relying solely on his ability to blend into his background, to meld into his hunting environment, so that he can catch whatever he needs to. Just have a look at that. Some of my favorite things. I must be honest with you, these small little insects and these small creepy crawlies, this is actually my passion. I absolutely love seeing how Mother Nature has equipped them to occupy all the niches that they do and hunt. There he goes, immediately looking like a piece of grass, extending those forms. Well, it's his reflection again. It's actually incredible. Their eyesight is actually good enough for him to see it. And that's a good two or three inches away from where you are at the moment, watching you, watching me. Now he starts to weave a little bit. That weave there was to look like grass. It's just the uncertainty that he's having at the moment. Doesn't quite know exactly what this other mantis in the reflection is up to seems to be mirroring his it uh, looks like he's going to try and strike at him again he's saying get off my patch i just can't even his coloration is identical to that of the grass mottled brown black and this tanny colored his spiked eyes Almost the entire head that you're having a look at there, barring the antennae of course, are made up of eyes. Eyes on the same plane, they binocular, meaning that he can see in depth and that allows him to strike out to those sparked forms of his and catch whatever's wandered too close to him. 
or her in actual fact, the size, probably about as long as my finger. Quite big for a mantis. Alrighty, we're going to leave this little hunter to his afternoons hunting. James has got something for you in the tent. It's not so much in the tent, but it is at the dam. Let's have a look here. Now there's the rover, that's Ronald's picture that he's looking at, and the buffalo has stood up to chew its cud. And just behind there, you can see some impala. Now those impala are the most common antelope that we get out here. I'm just gonna move the picture you've got so you can have a look at them there. There they are. Isn't that lovely? Beautiful, beautiful, elegant animals. Almost as elegant as Jamie, not quite and they're all going to come and concentrate around this water over the course of the next few months because we are in a drought. We're in the dry season of that drought. That was a birchal starling that just flew off there. And the birds, the buffalo, sometimes a hippopotamus, the elephants, the nyala and the impala are definitely going to come down here and depend on this water. And you can see there, dripping from that buffalo's mouth is a lot of saliva. Now, a buffalo is an unbelievably good digestive system if they can get enough water to drink. And so more and more, they're going to come down in huge concentrations to the last remaining bits of water like this, because that will help them in their ruminations. Now, there are nine unbelievably lovely species of antelope here in the Sabi sand, and we have put together a little montage of them all. Have a look. Nine beautiful species of antelope occur here at Juma. Late November is the birthing season. We marvel at wobbly wildebeest calves, fluffy diker lambs hiding in the thick bush, and the playful antics of the impala lambs. All of these youngsters are able to stand within half an hour of birth and run very soon after that. They must be able to escape from the lions, leopards, wild dogs, and other predators of the African wild. But before a male antelope has the privilege of fatherhood, he must fight. Astoundingly, these savage battles seldom end in death. The graceful yet powerful antelope of Juma are a constant source of wonder. Now, I was there for that little Nyala fight there, the sort of charcoal-coloured ones, and it was an unbelievable sighting. Just a quick shout-out to Andy Davis's father, Don, in South Carolina. You are most, most welcome, and I hope you're having a lovely, lovely Father's Day, Don. And Andy, I hope you're with your father, Don, as we sit here. Now, you are live, of course, so send us your shout-outs, your questions, hashtag Safari Live. We're in the middle of the iconic Kruger National Park, northeast corner of the most beautiful country on all of planet Earth, South Africa. Let's go back to look at the Prince of Cats. The Prince of Cats in the most beautiful country in the world. James could not be more correct. Now, my name is Jamie and I have a tale to tell you. A tale as true as Sindile is twitching away. And in fact, a tale that plays a very important role. About a year ago, Sindile and Shadow, when I first started working here, were the very first cats that I ever tracked on foot. Tracked and found on foot, and I'll never forget the sight of his little face watching me from a termite mound. Because, of course, we do have to do that. Animals are not necessarily always on the road, and sometimes you have to go looking for them. His little face poking out at me from the termite mound. Now, I said that young male leopards are absolutely incredible characters, and that's because they are continuously learning. The young females as well, but in my experience, the young female leopard cubs tend to be a little bit more dignified than the young males. Now, the story I have to tell you involves Sindile and another tracking incident a couple of months later, and I'm going to preface this by telling you that I was absolutely in no way threatened during this particular incident. I went to track him. I'd seen him in the morning and I went to go and see if I couldn't find him. He'd moved from his last position. So I went for a walk. I went for a walk through a drainage line. But a leopard is a tricky thing to spot and his tracks disappeared. And it was time for me to start heading back towards the vehicle. And then as I walked up the road, there was just this twitch of white in the corner of my eye. And there was little Sindile hiding behind a bush playing P. 
peekaboo with me because as soon as I saw him, he'd actually been in the process of walking out into the road to follow me. And he proceeded to follow me all the way back to the car. We basically played the most bizarre game of peekaboo I'd ever, ever played in my life. So what I'd do is I'd walk, but I'd be watching over my shoulder and he'd go into his leopard pose and he'd creep up the road. And then I'd turn around and look at him and he'd duck behind a bush and pop his head out and wait for me to turn around and keep walking. I promise you, he followed me about, probably about 300 yards back towards the vehicle. Now I say I felt no threat, and that was because he is a young, he was a young cub at that point. He was playful, he was learning. He then went on to stalk a water buck and a buffalo, both of which are animals far out of the realms of possibility. All he was doing was practicing the hunting skills, and thank goodness he was, because look at where he is now. He really needed them in this crucial time of his life. It was the most incredible sighting I've ever had with a leopard cub, and I think it was at that moment that I truly fell in love with the character that is Sindile. He is absolutely extraordinary. Now that is a cub story. Things would be very different now, and he is as wild as any other animal might be any other leopard and we absolutely respect that fully all of them are totally wild and although we're fortunate enough that they let us into their lives like this they are comfortable enough in their life with us in their lives absolutely we are constantly reading the signs they give us now jess on the subject of his hunting you have a really good question to have presented it to us and I think it's a question that's on everyone's mind so welcome Jess and thank you for that. The question was would he have had to learn to hunt again on during the time that he was in quarantine and then when he was re-released back into the wild. Jess absolutely he would have had to kind of learn to hunt again but incredibly for him that instinct was there from the moment, from that age where he stalked me up the road, that instinct and opportunism, he was already practicing the skills that he needed. And clearly, from the moment he was released, he wasn't provided with any food after that. He had to go out and find his own food, and it has worked out perfectly. That instinct, that hunting instinct that leopards has, have, is what saw him through the difficult month and a half that he has just faced, but it must have been incredibly confusing. Just imagine being in the wild and now all of a sudden being taken away and then put back in the wild. Now those hunting instincts that leopards have, that opportunism is what could make this afternoon switch in a moment because where we are right now anything could come stumbling across him and take either him by surprise or alternatively find themselves being seriously taken by surprise. You'll have to stay tuned after the break to find out if that does happen. And for our internet viewers, you don't have to go anywhere. And we are certainly not going anywhere because I am honestly not exaggerating when I tell you that in this drainage line system, I've walked through here and I've disturbed, while I've walked through here, I've disturbed probably about five or six Steenbok and Dacre that live in this area, which would be perfect prey for a leopard of Sindile's size. Although from what I hear, he's been doing extraordinarily well, even catching adult impala. But Jess's question was a really good one because I remember dealing with a, a cheetah in quarantine many, many years ago when I was still working in the Kalahari, I dealt with a cheetah in quarantine and we used to, that cheetah was fed during its time there. And the reason it was in quarantine was because it had been captured off a farm. The farmer basically said, get rid of this thing or I will. So they, they took it onto the reserve and they put it in a boma, in a fenced area, and they fed it for three months to get it used to the idea of being in this area and not going straight back to the farm that it was taken from. And I remember asking at the time, and it was when I just started out my career in the bush, asking the vet at the time if this cheetah wasn't actually going to get unfit in, while it was because we think of cheetah as these natural athletes and he, he, the cheetah was darted, it was anaesthetized at the time to fit a collar and he said to me come and feel the muscles of this cheetah and they're soft, they're really, they're soft and sort of squishy 
almost a completely different makeup to the muscles that we have. Well, the animals like this actually don't need to maintain the fitness. Their instinct comes into play and rescues them from that situation. Now, Sindile, for an update for those of you who are very familiar with the leopards of this area and for those of you who are not, the male leopard that we had yesterday on our live safari was seen about 500 yards away, first thing this morning, drinking from one of the water holes. Now that could be a very interesting encounter because this is a path that Mvula, the, the ex-dominant male leopard of this area, regularly walks through and across when he moves to the southwest. Now we've already seen the situation play out with Sindila and his mother and their very fraught reunion. It'd be another interesting thing to see how his reunion with a potential father, certainly a male that he could well be familiar with, would play out. My suggestion would be that he would send Sindile sprinting off because although Bula is relatively old, in leopard terms, and he has lost his control of this area, he is still much bigger than Sindile is. And while we wait for Sindile to make up his mind as to what he's going to do and try and avoid poking his head with the thorns, back across to James in the tent. Hello everybody, our loyal, wondrous followers. I'm just getting focus here on some gecko eggs inside Bilabab, the buffalo's head. Can I say Bilabab? Can I do that live to an American audience, do you think? I'm going to try. Okay, we've got one minute to TV. Let me remove this from the buffalo's cranium so that we might reveal him in all his glory. Now, the beefies seem to have absconded largely from the uh, water hole. I'm just going to drive off the rover there, see if we can see another one. Oh dear, oh dear. Ha! Ah. I think, I think the rover's going to turn over. No, it's righted itself. Oh, goodness. I've got Connor standing outside here, absolutely panicked that I'm going to drive his rover into the water. This is an entirely valid panic. It could happen at any stage. Right, 20 seconds, 20, here we go. Hello everybody, back again we are. You're here, live in the middle of the Kruger National Park, eight and a half million acres of untrammeled, wonderful wildlife, wilderness, and it's wonderful to have you with us. Please stay with us for the next little while. It is Father's Day, send us your shout outs, and I have two now. One to Hayden Turner, all the way in Australia. It's great to have him with us, one of our old time presenters and one of the greatest and most faithful safari livers in the world. Then to Bob, I think it is indeed. Tim, you wanted to send a message to Bob, your father, who is 85 years old and about to go on his first African safari. Bob, good on you. Can't wait to have you out here. South Africa will welcome you with open, open arms. Now, this buffalo is uh, probably unrelated to the ones that I was uh, sort of talking with, with Ronald in the pan. Uh, this long dead probably a few years now, and you can see the front of his face eaten off by lions and hyenas. Now that's of course rather grim. In fact, it's possibly disgusting, David. That's quite enough of that, thank you very much. Now, as with uh, George the giraffe, his cranium is not empty. Indeed, inside it is dwelling, well, hopefully soon will be dwelling, the eggs of a rather remarkable creature. Now we saw the gecko, have a look at this everyone, there we go. You saw that gecko earlier, the Bibron's thick-toed gecko. Say that three times, it'll make you feel good. Bibron's thick-toed gecko. And there are the two eggs of a Bibron's thick-toed gecko living inside the cranium of this old buffalo bull. And I think that's just unbelievable. They, we've been watching them now for about, I think we've been watching them for about a week and they haven't hatched. I think maybe they've been laid rather too early. 
simply because uh, it's winter now and reptiles, cold-blooded, like to be born in the summer. Now, our feral giraffe has got a primate to show you. Of course, just as James was linking, he was, the primate decided to move, and we are on a live safari. But there he is now, he's popped there. It's called a vervet monkey, uh, also sometimes referred to as a green monkey. And that's a big male. Now what he was doing, he was sitting up high in that marula tree, and he was keeping watch. You can see he doesn't like being on the ground. And he sprinted off. Now, he was keeping watch for leopards, lions, and other predators. They have incredible eyesight, and they are able to spot, I'm trying to see if there's a few more. I know there's a big troop around here, and it seems like he was the last of them, and he was keeping watch to make sure all of them could move through safely while he checked the potential danger area of the thickets behind us. And there he is. He's made it all the way to the next tree, and he's a bit far off now. Oh, let's go forward a bit. And he's off again. Oh, sorry about that. Well, we, this is live and we can't control the movement of the animals. And remember, shout outs for your dad on this wonderfully beautiful Father's Day safari. You can use the hashtag safari live. There's literally not a cloud in the sky. The light is gorgeous. And we're in search. And although we're deep here in the bush and we are on foot and we are in the sand and I've just drunk a whole cup full of elephant juice freshly squeezed out of an elephant dropping, it doesn't mean we have to be uncivilized. And right here, we have a soap bush. Have a look at this. Now, I'm going to show you how to make some soap quickly. Strip off some of the leaves. Just like that. You accelerate the process with a little bit of water. And then you start to make your soap. And very quickly, soap starts to come out of the leaves. It's full of what they call saponins. Just have a look at that. Gets nice and soapy in there. You wash your hands. In my case, washing off all that elephant juice. And you can see that sheen. Hypoallergenic, of course. You can use it on babies. You can use it wherever you feel like, to be quite honest. Me, I quite enjoy that. I probably need a little bit for around my mouth after what I attempted to do a little bit earlier. <laughs> All right. All righty. And from us, you're going through to Jamie. He's got some delay. Oh, and Sindile just gave us the most movement he's given us all afternoon. And he moved about a meter away from the spot where he was lying. But welcome back onto the back of the vehicle known as Rusty. My name is Jamie and we have this extraordinary young male leopard. One of the most famous leopard characters in the world. Well, since he has decided to plop himself down right there, Let's reposition ourselves ever so slightly. Mm, maybe not, we've actually got a view. Now this is a good sign. The fact that he's yawning, the fact that he's restless, that he's got up and moved. He moved first of all because it's kind of like turning over your pillow and resting your head on the cool side of the pillow. That's what he's just done. The earth beneath him got a bit warm and so he shifted and moved away. But the fact that he's yawning and the fact that the temperature has dropped bodes exceptionally well for the potential that he might start moving at any moment. Uh, yet, if he starts to lick his paws, he's giving us all the indications that he might be getting ready to get up and start moving. Isn't he just such a handsome fellow? Uh, we have absolutely no idea who his father was, is, on this special think. There's something a little bit almost Anderson about his eyes. There he goes. Hello, boy. What's there? I'm going to keep nice and quiet because he is going to... I think he's thinking about walking right past the vehicle. He's just stopped for a quick break. And there you have it. Look at those 
piercing blue-green eyes. This is just phenomenal. Hello, boy. It is so good to see you again. And Jordan, welcome on our live safari. If you are joining us for the very first time, you wanted to know how many animals have these GPS collars, like the jaguar in front of you. Well, first of all, Johnson, it's just Sindile, and I'll give you a very brief history. Essentially, Sindile, although he is a totally wild leopard, had a very unfortunate encounter with a domestic dog that had rabies. So he's been vaccinated and he's now being monitored now that he's back into the wild. But Johnson, he's not a jaguar. He is in fact a leopard because this is where we are coming to from is alive in the middle of the African bush. Uh, we don't have jaguars here, although it is a dream of mine to see jaguars in the wild one day. But our leopards are equally extraordinary. But Sindile, which means the survivor, as far as I know, Sindile is the only leopard that has a collar and only because he has one of the most extraordinary stories that I have ever heard in the wild in my entire life. The only time that I have ever seen human intervention to this extent and it has just played such an incredible role in this young male leopard's life. It's because of that collar that he was able to be released back into the wild once again. And while he decides what to do, it's time for us to send you back across to the tent. And for those of you who are watching on television, you can always keep track of these stories. You can follow us each and every day on the internet, every day, twice a day, on wildsafarilive.com. So if we don't have an ending for Sindile's story, we will do in the future. Back across to James now as Sandile sharpens his claws. I'm so glad that Mighty Prince has stood up. This was not a Mighty Prince, but it may have been a Mighty Princess in its time. It's a female verdant hawk moth. How beautiful is that? Now, while you have a look at that, and while I put it under the microscope, Phil Schultz, you're sitting with your father, Phil Schultz Sr. That's easy to remember and you're watching and reminiscing about your time in southern africa i think that's wonderful you know my earliest wilderness memory is of a time climbing a mighty baobab tree with my father i think i was just 11 years old and i get a little tearful every time i think about it it's one that's a great memory i've got and let's have a look now at this verdant moth under the microscope look at that isn't that incredible now, I think you'll find, I don't know much about the verdant moth, the verdant hawk moth, other than that, that it eats uh, nectar. And you can just see that little bit of coppery stuff sticking out from the bottom of its jaw. That is the proboscis. And the proboscis is a fancy word of, for saying sort of a long sticky bit out the front of the nose. And that will be put into flowers to suck the nectar. And the reason I know that this is not a mighty prince is because of the antenna. Can you see the antenna there? Those and whoops, hang on a second, I've lost control. There we are. The antenna, which are losing control again. I'm sorry, those are my fingers, everybody. They're not part of the moth. There are the antenna. Ooh, one of them's come off. That makes it very easy. Right. Now, <laughs> let me just get, oh, it's getting blown around. Anyway, it does not have what we call a combed antenna. And if we look at it like this, I think it's probably a bit easier if I hold it. There's a howling gale blowing in from the northwest. Well, it's not really, it's a gentle zephyr, but it's enough to blow this lady out. Now, if you look close in at the antenna there, you can see that they do not have combs on them. Now, the combs of a moth are what picks up the pheromones that a verdant moth like this would have let off when she was ready to mate. Sorry, she's very slippery, slippery customer. And that, of course, all of you will know that when you catch a moth, it leaves a sort of dust mark on whatever it touches. And those are the scales. They don't actually have hairs, although this moth looked like it had hairs there. They weren't hairs, and they're very slippery. Isn't that just wonderful? I think that's beautiful. Now, we're gonna look at one or two other things under this microscope. Ronald has been retrieved because he's about to make a, an appearance at the fireside chat, if you can believe it. Uh, Let's just have a look here at the top of this baboon spider. Now, we looked at the baboon spider yesterday. 
And this baboon spider would have been stung round about there by a spider hunting wasp. And the spider hunting wasp lays an egg inside the abdomen. There's the abdomen there. Look at those beautiful copper colors. I think that's just too stunning for words. And look at those hairs. And the spider hunting wasp would have stung it on the back of the abdomen, laid an egg inside. And while immobile, completely immobile, I'll just take him out again and show you on my hand. You can see, I mean, for most people, this would be an utterly terrifying activity. There you can see the spider. Now, for most, like I say, he's been stung there and probably not dead, interestingly. Quite possibly still alive, but totally paralyzed. And the wasp's poison would have paralyzed him. The egg will hatch in the abdomen there, and it will then eat the innards out of the spider. So, I mean, it's quite a clever strategy if you're a wasp. It's a really awful time if you happen to be a spider. But what happens is that the spider stays alive, which means that when the wasp eggs hatch, they have fresh food to eat. Now, what we're looking at there is the, are the pedipalps and the eyes. Now, the pedipalps are those sort of, um, looks almost like a camel's toe at the front of the spider. So we'll put him under the microscope again. And there you can see the pedipalps, which are topped with those rather terrifying looking sharp, shiny black fangs. He had excellent dental hygiene, this, did this fellow. Now, that's enough of the spider. In about half a minute, we're going to go to a small break and then we're going to set up next to the fireside. Now it is Father's Day, which is an ostensibly male day, inescapably, and uh, many males around the world are fascinated by the world of technology. Now we're going to look at a lot of the technology that is involved with bringing you a high definition signal out of the iconic Kruger National Park. We'll be looking at the final control, the rovers, the drones, the walking, and the most romantic job in the world, that of wildlife cameramen. We'll see you then. All right, everybody on the internet, lovely to have you with us. Stay with us. We're going to have a short fireside chat. There's a bit of an advert break. Let's go back to Jamie and that wonderful leopard. You do not have to miss out on one moment of this incredible sight of this wonderful cat hunting in the glorious evening sunlight. And we have been joined by another vehicle. Taxon is here with us. Taxon, of course, has provided us with some of our best sightings on Safari Live and his guests getting to experience this wonderful moment. And guys, this leopard is thinking about walking straight towards James at the fireside chat. He's just, just changed the direction. And he's hungry. Let's go forward a little bit, let's reposition so that we can get around the other vehicle. Ah, Sundile, it is marvellous to see you once again. The hyenas are calling as well. This could turn out to be quite dramatic. The hyenas are not far away at all. They're whooping. He might be heading towards that termite mound. Give him a good vantage point. Unfortunately, he is heading towards a really thick block. And I think he's just going to keep pacing around quarantine. Uh, I don't... He's actually, he's going to pop out right by the tent. We can see the tent and Sindile at the same time. I'll show you in a moment. While they prepare for fireside chat, you go forward a little bit, I can show you what I mean. This is incredible. He's watching them as they prepare for fireside chat. There's the reverse end of the tent. And there is Sindile. Could, um, it, it's incredible the way our big cats. There he goes, he's gonna run. He's a bit nervous of people on foot, is what we can tell almost immediately. He's dashed past. Now with him showing these kind of signs of nervousness, he's probably gonna run straight towards the thick drainage line. He's now running flat out. Because it's open, he doesn't feel safe, he doesn't have the comfort of the closed off areas. Okay, we're just going to have our vision obscured for a moment. There we go. 
and there he dashes, and he's running again. Now he's clearly, you can see in his body language that this leopard is stressed out a bit, but he's stressed out by the sight of people, sorry again, the sight of people moving about, even though they're incredibly far away. Which is a good thing, actually, because he's a leopard that's just been released from essentially captivity. So he needs to be a little bit wary of people on foot. We would far rather that than the other way around, of him being completely comfortable. He is showing signs of distress. I'm not going to follow much further. I'm going to keep my distance, and I'm going to let him move off at his own natural pace. I just want to see if I can't find you one last view. But I'm not going to stress him out any further. We're very far away now from where I last saw him. And it's very important, guys. We're here in, in their home, not the other way around. They're not here to provide us with entertainment or to please us, although they do that anyway, and they do give us the most incredible moments to share with them. But at the end of the day, they are wild animals, and they're wild animals to be treated with the utmost of respect and he's he's nervous now he's run away yeah, and, it, and it's time for us to say goodbye to you all one last view of the marvelous Sindile bye bye everyone it is time for fireside chat I hope you have the most marvelous of times